and welcome to Lincolnshire Police live Facebook question and answer session. Um, I'm Karen Wilson, the Assistant Chief Constable here, and collectively with me and help me answer some of these questions um, is... Afternoon, Paul Timmins. Uh, I'm the uh, substitute gold for when Karen isn't around, and I'm also the Head of Specialist Operations in Lincolnshire. And I'm Stuart Renner, and I'm one of the sub commanders for the COVID response. Okay, and we've got our head of comms, Lucy, who is going to ask some questions. And any of the, the questions that come in live time, um, I've got Janine having a look at those, um, and they'll be feeding them in. So we'll do our absolute best to answer all of these. If we don't get through all of your questions, then we will try and follow them up afterwards um, if, we, if we go beyond this hour. Okay, thank we'll, you. We'll start with some um, that were unanswered from the previous Q&A just because we ran out of time, so we can't get through them all, um, so we'll just pick those up again. The first one is from Mags Knight, who says, Please can you let me know if I would be reprimanded if I travel to North London to see my mum. She's elderly, 86 years old, fragile and has lots of medical issues. I need to make sure she's well and coping and if she needs any shopping. My son does live with her, though he works as security, so he's not always there. Well, I think, um, Mags Knight, that that would sounds like it would be an unreasonable journey to do um i get that your mum will be um potentially vulnerable but i would hope that you're going to get the support from um neighbors the community groups as well as your son to be able to ensure that her needs are met if you were living with her that would be a different thing in or, or living within a few minutes of her just making sure you drop shopping off for her etc but traveling all the way down to london for a one-off just to give you peace of mind is potentially going to put other people at um, risk so i urge you not to do that until the restrictions are lifted somewhat and another one that came in um is was from an anonymous um uh, asker they didn't want to provide their name who says i've seen some videos from the chief constable on your social media channels about coronavirus but what is his role in this scenario um, thank you for that. The, um, the chief officer team um, have all got different roles within um, operating the coronavirus situation within force and national roles as well. So the chief constable, um, Bill Skelly, has got a national role um, and he also leads the other forces in the region to link into the national um, coronavirus uh, police chief's council. So whatever goes on nationally, he's our representative there and he brings that information back to us in force. Um, and if I can expand a little bit in terms of where the deputy is as well, Deputy Jason Harwin, he is leading the local resilience forum, which is the partnership approach to um, coronavirus, making sure all the testing centres, things like that, are all working together collectively. And then my role um, is the lead for coronavirus in force. Um, and so we've all got very separate roles. So that's probably why you see a lot more of me dealing with this sort of um, stuff than you do with than the chief. One from Jane Webb who asks, why are people being allowed to mingle in Boston Town Centre and drinking? Thank you. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I can certainly answer that. I mean, I mean, firstly, we would welcome any uh, reports of that, that that do come in, and, and on a daily basis, uh, I sit at the, the meetings that, that Stuart will will, that will chair, where we have uh, updates around reports such as those, where perhaps people have been uh, not socially distancing, we've been groups gathered together in particular places, and what we get back um, very much more often than not is from, from the operational response that those issues are dealt with. Um, and that uh, there's uh, some action that's taken. Often that action is engaged in uh, education and people will uh, take heed of the advice we're giving. In rare circumstances, it, we need to uh, go on to enforcement and uh, we have enforced uh, that uh, those sorts of circumstances over the past five to six weeks. But I say, thankfully, it, it is rare. But uh, thank you for the raising that with us. And I know that uh, the Divisional Commander for East is probably listening at this now. Um, He'll certainly be taking note of that as well. Um, Boston uh, has been an area where we've, we've seen some activity within the marketplace in the Central Park area, but equally we've also had some great support from uh, our partners around that and we've had uh, some good engagement and good education around there as well. So um, uh, most of the time it's, it's few and far between where we have to enforce. 
Another one from Richard Young, um, who asks, why can't police officers have tattoos on hands and neck? I looked at becoming a special, but decided not to, as the information on tattoos made it seem like I would be said no to from the beginning. Um, we've relaxed our um, stance on having tattoos. At one point, it was a big no-no, but we recognise that um, more and more people are wearing tattoos and um, it, the, the body art is acceptable. Um, it depends what your tattoos are on your face and neck. We still want our officers to be professional. Um, and um, we do ask for photographs of the tattoos as well for new recruits coming in. So I would urge you, it depends on what it is. I can't actually see what that is, but, but still apply and send your photographs in. If you can have um, tattoos which are not that visible around the neck, etc., then it might be um, acceptable to us. But we do have strict guidelines about ensuring that we've got the right image for the public um, because we want them to have confidence in us. And I'm not against tattoos at all. Um, but it does need to be up to a reasonable level. Another one from an anonymous um, asker, please. They say, um, lots of horses have been using TikTok recently. What's your stance in Lincolnshire? Well, I'm not on TikTok, um, but my godchildren are, and they've sent me some great videos while I've been down here. So, um, and I have seen some of the other forces that have put TikTok videos out. There's been a great one in West Midlands about um, recruiting from diverse communities so there is a place for TikTok but for us our advice is for any any of our staff members if they want to do something promotional on TikTok is that they get in touch with our media team to work together with the media team as to what that um, needs to look like I do recognise that there's um, it's a completely different audience and if we want to engage and communicate with different people at different um, on different platforms then we do need to embrace it all. But what I also want to do is make sure again that it's a professional way of doing this and that we understand what's going on. What I don't want is um, somebody getting into trouble because they just overstepped the mark. So it's trying to protect our officers and staff as well from getting a little bit carried away. And one's coming from um, the office of Sir John Hayes. It's a, an inquiry from a constituent who asked whether they could travel to collect their daughter who's had to give up their flat in London because they've lost their job. She can no longer afford the rent and needs to return home to live for the time being. The constituent was nervous about travelling to collect her. Yeah, and I actually spoke to um, Sir John about that particular case um, to give some reassurance that moving house is within the guidelines that the government's given. And so if you're moving house, whether it's because you've lost your job or whatever, so in this particular case, the, um, the, the person in question is moving from their accommodation in London back to the parents' house in Lincolnshire. Of course, then um, we, we need to be able to support and allow people to, to make that move happen. So there's no problem whatsoever for moving house and going to collect your daughter and, and all of her goods, etc. Another one from Lee McHugh, he asks, what are the police doing to support our police officers' mental health during what is obviously going to be a stressful time for you all? You guys have to take the risk of catching it each day to protect us. Just wanted to know if extra support is in place beyond the usual normal levels of support in this current climate. We do care about you all and keep up the amazing job. Thank you for that comment. And I'm going to turn to Stu because he's very much involved in our approach. We set up a specific welfare cell as part of our response just to make sure that any queries like that uh, can go in from officers, etc. So we can signpost people to get appropriate support. We always have got a very, very wide support mechanism within uh, the police service anyway because of the nature of most of the incidents that we, we do deal with. So in the first instance, you know, it's always going to be around officers, colleagues, supervisors, managers. Uh, making sure that they're okay and then we have got um, various different referral me mechanisms for um, initial trauma assistance and also for support uh, from wider uh, counsellors etc but the main thing for us is making sure that officers and their families are supported so from very close to the start of the outbreak we've been able to offer uh, testing uh, as key workers to officers and their families and staff members and their families because actually it's a lot of it is the not knowing and just making sure that, that we can get people tested but the final thing is we we really concentrate on providing officers with appropriate information um, because it's very often not understanding or not knowing causes the problems rather than people who are well informed 
think we've had some brilliant feedback as well to the welfare cell so all of those officers who have and um, staff who have contacted the welfare cell have been hugely complimentary um, and um, we've also had instances of um, family members working for other agencies where they've felt that they've had more support from the police as a family as opposed from their own um, organisations so I'm really proud of the work that the welfare cell have done around this and um, it, all the way up to myself and if there's anybody tested positive or anybody in a family circumstances that's tested positive I will personally have those phone calls with them to make sure that they feel reassured about what their place in the world and they're not under particular pressure to come back to work if they're not feeling up to it. Uh, Chris Stones asks, I went for my daily walk and there were three adults, one child. An officer said she was going to issue a notice if we were seen together. However, we lived together. Who was in the right? I got threatened to be arrested over arguing. Oh. Yeah, that, I can answer that. I mean, given those circumstances there, I'm, I'm just looking at the question just to make sure I've got it right. Um, if we're all in the same, same household um, at that moment in time uh, and you're out for a walk together, then they're, they're, for me, there's no issue uh, with that at all. Um, sometimes uh, we, we won't get it absolutely spot on every time and, and we really would welcome feedback when we don't get it uh, so so right so that we can absolutely learn from that. Um, on that occasion, from what you've said there, Chris, uh, there'd be no issue in, in what you were doing. Um, uh, you know, also, the thing to bear in mind as well is that all of us in various different ways are under different stresses and sometimes we don't always react in the way that we'd want to react. Uh, so uh, I think on that, that occasion, I'm sorry that you've had that experience, um, but I would say that you know, if you, you know, explain to an officer if they do challenge you that you're in the same household uh, and that you're out for your, for your walk for the day, uh, that should be absolutely fine. And just a couple more from the previous Q&A and then we'll move to the live ones. So Debbie Allen asks, can do two window cleaners travel in the same work van if they wear full PPE? If they're working together and they're work colleagues, then there's no issue with them being in the in the vehicle together. Police officers have to double crew and be in the vehicle together, um, so there's um, that is allowed for. And I think as we go further into the potential of lifting of restrictions, where more people are going back to work, um, we are seeing more people who are travelling together to the workplaces. And just one last one from the previous ones again about work. Uh, Dan Danielle Holcomb asks, is it okay to have neighbours having workmen doing their gardens? Yes, that, there's no rules against um, gardeners continuing on doing their, their work. Um, the government guidelines are clear to say that you should work from home if you can. Clearly a gardener can't do that remotely. And just having a look at some questions that are coming in now from... Hannah Louise Gregory, if we have applied for a position, do you know when we will find out? Sorry, so, could you just repeat that? Again, if you have applied for a position, I'm assuming just for a vacancy um, uh, for here, do you know when you'll find out? Um, depends what vacancy it is and what the deadline is on um, and the process. So that's far too wide of a question for me to give you a really detailed answer, but um, all of our HR processes are still working and um, in the manner that they should be working. So if you've applied for something, um, I'm sure they'll be getting in touch at some point to tell you what the next steps of that application is, whether it's interview um, or, or whether you've been successful or not. And good luck. Uh, I've got another one here from George Ranshaw. How is it push bike riders can go out on a 10 mile ride, but we motorbikes aren't allowed? I think you'll find that push bike is using energy that contributes to physical exercise. Sitting on a motorbike, although they might be heavy to lift up, etc., is not really physical exercise, and I think that's the difference there. So your physical exercise can be bike rides, can't be motorbike rides. Uh, just to add to that question as well, from uh, Jackie Wright, what's um, what's local for a bike ride? It, it, how long is a piece of string? I suppose it. it, it we must be really careful to try not to put too much definition on on some of these because it will be based upon circumstances at the time. Um, some pedal cyclists who are pretty good and pretty fast could go on twenty or thirty mile rides within a uh, you know a thirty minute forty minute um, journey. Um, 
whereas others might like me would probably take about four hours to do that sort of distance um but it's uh it really isn't case by case and we certainly at the police service won't be putting some definition around that what we do put definition around is where we've got uh people that are traveling two or three four hours to get to a destination to go for a walk that for me at this moment in time is not an essential journey and certainly isn't to further exercise at that point so we, we do we are quite clear about that but stuff like described there we wouldn't put uh, a definition on. Uh, from laura parker my neighbor states she has a letter from the government to say she's allowed her dad around he's in the garden and house no distancing is it true that you can get a letter she says it's due to her pregnancy and partner's mental health that they are allowed visitors yeah, that's really difficult to, con um, to comment on somebody's personal circumstances. Um, I'm not aware of letters from the government, but there is guidance on the government websites um, about the support that vulnerable people might need. So um, I think that's all I can comment on on that one without getting into anyone's personal circumstances. But I think, like I said last time, none of us know. Um, the individual circumstances for our neighbours and people travelling on buses and on cars, etc. We just have to be a little bit more open to why people might need things, especially when it comes to mental health um, and your mental well-being. Uh, from Lucy Williams, I keep hearing different things. Can we drive 15 minutes to a safer place to walk our dog? Yep. I, think, I think that's quite reasonable. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds reasonable, especially if you're living in a built up area and you need to, to get out to somewhere a bit more um, open so that you can walk your dog, then, then that would be a reasonable excuse. So if you if you stopped by the police officers and you um, stated where you lived and where your, your destination was, um, my officers would actually take that as a reasonable journey. If it was five hours from your home address to go and walk your dog somewhere nice, then that would not be reasonable. Uh, from Jenny Kirkwood, can you please clarify the position for young people? My 17-year-old was issued a verbal warning whilst walking within our town yesterday. He'd been working all morning and was out for one hour of exercise. So I think the difficulty is, again, without knowing the individual circumstances, it's very difficult to comment. Um, the, what we've basically explained there is is the strategy that our officers are using so we're looking at engaging with people um we're, we're looking at educating them we're not trying to enforce so without knowing the full circumstances um it, i think that is reasonable that somebody has been spoken to and asked uh, about what they're doing and whether or not they're returning home because you don't know what other circumstances apply to, to that particular issue. It's not as if somebody's been given a ticket or any other enforcement taking place. Uh, I've got a question from Baz Milne. With more and more takeaways opening and roads getting blocked up with up to 30 vehicles, is this now considered as an essential journey? So, it's, so people queuing up to in order to go and get a takeaway? Um, yeah, that that is an issue. Uh, you know, it's an issue that's happened locally near where I live as well recently. Um, it's always going to be a bit of a balance because I think as, as we're finding where, where perhaps things that haven't been open for a little while start to reopen, there seems to be a tendency and a natural sort of instinct that everyone wants to go there at the same time. Now, in terms of the legislation, the guidance, um, all right from the start, uh, food outlets that were offering a takeaway service uh, were, were allowed to continue operating. Um, I think where the problem lies is, where, as I said, when things have been closed down for a while and start to reopen and people have perhaps got fed up with beans on toast for tea, uh, want to go and get something uh, a bit nicer for tea, that they start to, to go out and obviously in their cars. In terms of policing, um, what we would say is we, we would try and facilitate that where possible, but we'd absolutely ask the takeaway um, uh, outlets to really consider their opening times and their the method in which they publicise it because you know, they have to take some responsibility as well known it's like to be quite an influx of, of custom coming in. We clearly don't want traffic disruption, um, but if somebody was travelling towards a takeaway to go and pick a takeaway up, uh, that would be a, a reasonable journey, uh, as long as, again, it's not 40 miles. If it's you know locally to your local takeaway, that would be a reasonable journey. But we have been experiencing some traffic issues with that. Uh, we've just got an email from Christine. Uh, my mum has told me that it's neighbour's birthday tomorrow and that she's having family visit. She thinks this is okay as the neighbour has told her that you're allowed visitors on your birthday. 
The neighbour has family around most days of the week, as my mum tells me when I phone her. Yesterday, we went to take my mum her shopping and the neighbour had her daughter and grandson there again. Tomorrow, I know there'll be a lot of people there in the afternoon celebrating her birthday. Can you please confirm that this is not allowed as mum is only listening to what the neighbours tell her? Thank you. Yeah, we've, we've, we've had a few of them and it's whether it's your birthday or not, it's what is allowed within the guidance about visiting people. If you're visiting somebody vulnerable to take them some um, shopping or drop something off, um, then that would be allowed, even if it was dropping the presents off at the, at the door, um, then that would be a reasonable thing to do if you've got elderly parents, but it wouldn't be that you go into the house and you celebrate and have a birthday party and you have a big gathering there. That's not within the guidelines. Um, from a boom box, a question from him or her. Uh, firstly, many thanks for the stream. Where can I report people breaking the lockdown rules? It currently seems like you've just given up enforcing it, to be honest, as everything's returning to normal at a rapid pace without instruction. Well, I don't think it is returning to a rapid pace, so I have to disagree with you on that because we still see that there's, um, even though the traffic buildup is starting to um, increase to where it was when the lockdown first came about, we're still only about 10% higher than we were um, three or four weeks ago on the traffic. Um, we still get uh, a large amount of calls, but we've had them all the way through um, this lockdown period. So people are potentially getting frustrated people do want to to go out i just urge people not to until we understand when the restrictions are going to be lifted if you've got concerns over a large gathering then please report it to us through 101 and we will take the details of that what we won't do is um police somebody's coming and going of their own house to say how many times have you have you left your house today that's not what our job is there for and then just in terms of the enforcement, as of this morning, we've, as a force, have issued 184 fixed penalty notices and we've recorded 395 instances where we've given people verbal advice. So we are going out there, we are actually advising people, we are enforcing where we absolutely have to. And by all means, if, if you dial 101 or use the online reporting uh, systems, it'll be logged and, and we'll assess as to whether or not it requires a police response. Uh, from John Fuller, what are you doing to stop people using a mobile phone while actually driving? Massive problem in Lincolnshire, it seems to be out of control. Okay, uh, given that road safety uh, is part of my responsibility in, in force, um, mobile phone use whilst driving is one of our fatal four uh, um, areas of focus along with speeding, seatbelts uh, and, and drink drive. Um, it is an issue, it is a problem. Um, Historically, uh, within Lincolnshire, we, we have used a number of different methods to enforce upon this. Uh, we do have things such as uh, we'll have uh, HGVs that will be parked, that will be inside that we can actually look down on vehicles, particularly vehicle cars, obviously, and, and catch people doing it. We have our motorcycles that are out there, and our traffic cars and our local policing uh, um, cars that are out there and we'll pick up and, and challenge people when, when we do catch them uh, driving with mobile phones and we will deal with it positively every time. Uh, it is something that uh, we don't ignore, clearly can't be everywhere all of the time and there will be instances where uh, people are using it and members of the public are seeing that and there will be no police around to, to challenge. What I will say is that we, um, where we do see those offences we deal with them Sadly, some of, some of those offences have resulted in some serious collisions uh, in the recent past and um, drivers get prosecuted. My, my ask to everybody within Lincolnshire really is, is you know, if you see it, um, please report it. Uh, we do have a, an ability to go back and look at dash cam footage and, and the like to potentially capture evidence that way. Uh, but it's, it's an ongoing battle uh, uh, that we're, we're, we're facing here. There is a, a big piece around uh, educating drivers, younger drivers as well, as they're coming through and learning how to drive. But equally, it's not just younger drivers, it's some of the more experienced drivers that we've seen this from as well. So the message back is that we do challenge it. We can't be everywhere all the time, but we, we're dealing with it um, when we see that opportunities to deal with it. We'll just go back to some of the questions that came into us before the live session started. One from uh, Rain Millard One, who was replying to a picture of um, some of the, the beaches that we put out on Twitter. And he says, I don't understand this. Wide open spaces outside could take many people 
with more than enough social distancing. I feel safer on a beach like this than I would in a supermarket. Please explain your logic. So it's not necessarily our logic, it's the guidance that the government's given. Um, but so we haven't made the rules up on this. The guidance from the government is very much along the lines of what's a reasonable journey. If you live in the area, so if you live in um, Skegness town, for instance, and walking out to take your daily exercises on the beach, then that's absolutely fine. If you're travelling from Nottingham or wherever to get to Skegness to go on the beach, then that's not fine. It's the unreasonable journey that um, is part of the issue. Plus, the um, if if that was lifted, if that restriction was lifted completely, we get thousands and thousands of visitors on the beach in Skegness um, and Maplethorpe and elsewhere every year. Um, and it's very quickly that beach would not be an isolated beach where somebody can have to take a walk. In addition, it then adds to all of the congestion on the roads, the potential for um, for traffic accidents and other incidents that other people have to get involved in, police, NHS, etc. And just on the back of that as well, it's just worth bearing in mind that through through this whole crisis, the focus from our government has been around protecting the NHS so they can get on and, and deal with some uh, some of the issues and not overload in various areas. In Lincolnshire, the Lincolnshire NHS system is fit for purpose for the Lincolnshire residents. Uh, it isn't set up to take thousands and thousands and thousands of extra people coming into the county. Um, so it, it also creates a risk there. Uh, that's another reason why we, we really have been quite strong on not having visitors coming into the county. The one from Adrian Chapman that came to us before the session. He asks, when someone reports someone missing and when you find that person and child, why don't you phone the person who reported them missing to tell them that you have found them? No wonder no one has faith in the police. The person that reported them missing has not had the police contact them for over 12 hours and the person and child reported at night time. Adrian, it sounds like you've potentially had a, a really challenging um, and distressing time if that's in relation to either yourself or your family or somebody that you normally are close to who's had an experience like that. Whenever a kid goes missing or um, a loved one goes missing, then it's always going to be heightened emotional time for somebody. Um, we've got quite a, a robust system in, in place in terms of who we do tell, who we report to, who we update. Um, and it needs to be next of kin if it's a child or if the child's in care then it'll be potentially social services. So the parent might not always get to know if they don't have parental responsibility for an individual. However, um, the people who do need to know in terms of the adult who's looking after the child um, will be made aware of that. If it's an adult or if it's um, somebody who's over 17 and they didn't want anybody else knowing, um, including the person who reported them missing, then that's their right not to have that person informed as well. So whilst that might cause some distress to the people who are concerned, we also have to take into account the individual's right um, to, to be notified or have their details shared with somebody else. So I'm really um, sorry if that's been an experience that somebody you know or yourself has, um, has been involved in. The, you should be able to get that information from the police officers who you spoke to, just to advise you that they may not have come back to you and the reasons why they haven't come back to you. One from Eve Skelton, she asks, are the motorway police going to be out stopping people travelling to the coast? It needs to be stopped before they get there. My family are living in Grimsby and Cleethorpes and need the protection as they have kept cases low. We don't have a motorway, but no. um, I'll let you answer yeah, this one. Yeah, anyway, so we, we don't have a motorway police, but I think, did, were they from Grimsby and Cleethorpes? Uh, they don't say, so they've okay. got family there. Right, okay, so, so Grimsby and Cleethorpes are in Humberside, but obviously we're really in close contact with um, and work closely with Humberside. With they, they have got a motorway that goes along the north of the, the uh, county. Um, broader than that, though, yeah, in answer to the question, yes, we we want to try and prevent before uh, having those issues out on the coast. So um, you may recall back at Easter time, uh, we had some good weather like we have coming up now again, uh, and the bank holiday weekend there. We had um, I personally had a conversation with. Uh, our, our East Midlands uh, colleagues um, in other forces and asking for their support in, in terms of encouraging or discouraging people from travelling to the coast. And I know that uh, across all their counties, they were having those stop checks. They were looking at 
caravans and camper vans and people that looks as if perhaps they were loaded up for a bit of a weekend on the coast. Those vehicles were being stopped in those counties. We also have had um, towards the coast some more focus on the arterial roads that go into the coast so that uh, we can stop people and, and ask where they're going, what the purpose of the journey is. Um, and it has been really, really successful. Um, the, the Easter weekend was very, very quiet on the coast. Uh, we have that same, those same tactics in place uh, for, for the coming uh, few weeks. Uh, and uh, if anybody is thinking about traveling to the coast for a day trip or for a weekend, be prepared to be stopped because you will be, and, and we will be turning you around. One from Malcolm McBeath, who asks, all the government online sites, even the Prime Minister, present lockdown as advisory guidance. Now, whether do they, do they say it's law? What exactly is the law? Where is it written in statute? What does it say? Are some fines for being out unlawful? One certainly gets that impression. Um, well, there's two aspects. There's, there's the COVID legislation, which has got um, specific uh, sort of rules and regulations which can be enforced, the majority of which aren't actually enforced by, by the police, the majority of which uh, relate to businesses, uh, etc. Uh, the guidance is, is something different. That, that literally is to provide some sort of um, advice and, and, uh, and, and some information for people to make rational decisions. Now, as with all legislation, this one uh, was was brought forward to enable us to react to, to an absolutely unprecedented situation. So, so some of it isn't as well researched as would normally be the case. But the bottom line around this is, is the, the ethos behind it is, is, is literally what the government has been pushing forward. It's about staying at home, protecting the NHS and saving lives. The enforcement that we do is for people who, when we engage, when we educate, when we inform, who don't respond and would present, therefore, a risk to the public at large. And that is when we can use enforcement methods to, to force people to do something that otherwise they may not wish to do. And I think, in, in reality, that's the best way I can explain the difference between guidance and, and legislation. So I think you can find on the government website if you um, in the search engine just um, search for the coronavirus bill that will give you the specific legislation about the rules and what can be enforced and what can't be enforced and then the government.co.uk um, website will give you all sorts of different guidance in um, different aspects of both operational work um, your leisure time, et cetera, et cetera. That will give you the guidance there as to what the government hopes you will adhere to in order to try and keep this virus at bay. And we've got links to those from our website. Yeah, links on our website to all of those different um, linked pages. Anne Hale asks us, my father is terminally ill, but not COVID-19 related. The nursing home is in Blackburn, Lancashire. One of my siblings live locally, but I live in Laos. When the nursing home tells us the end is approaching, am I allowed to travel there to visit? And if yes, is there a, restric is there a restriction on the mode of transport I have to use, car or train? Um, I'm really sorry, Anne, that your father's in this position and that um, that you're unable to just go all, all of the times that you would want to be able to do that. The, um, the, legislate, the guidance is clear in terms of a reasonable journey. And if the reasonable journey is to go and see your father at the end of his life, um, then that would be uh, treated with the compassion and the respect that um, my officers certainly would give if they saw you and stopped you on the road in Lincolnshire. But hopefully that would be the same across the other forces that you'd have to travel through. Um, and in terms of the mode of transport that is done to yourself, I'm not sure whether the, the train and bus routes, etc., or operating as normal but if you were in a vehicle and you stopped in a vehicle and you gave that um, explanation if you were asked for it then um, you would be treated with the compassion that you would be clearly under the, um, the requirements to have. Um, Samuel Crook asks um, I was looking at picking up a parrot two hours from me is this okay during these lockdown rules I'll be practicing social distancing on pickup it will be contact uh, well, there's a new one. I've never had one about a parrot before. And um, there is some quicker out not, tweeting it or something, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not I, quite sure how to answer that one, but apart from is it a reasonable journey? 
if it's not a reasonable journey, then you shouldn't be doing it. If it's not for work purposes, then you shouldn't be doing it. Um, and I'm sure the parrot can live without you for a few more weeks. Really questions I've got from uh, Ewan Green. Um, what are your thoughts on helping to remove the criminality aspect from cannabis consumers within Lincoln? Is there an opportunity for cannabis consumers to be provided a safe place to consume safely without having to deal with any criminals, dealers or gangs? There are a lot of people who genuinely need it for medicine. However, the law deems them criminals along with cocaine, heroin and drug users. I think that's a hugely big question um, to, to try and answer on here. There is a big national debate going on. Um, our deputy, Jason Harwin, is um, one of the national leads on, on drug legislation. There is a big debate going on about um, the medicinal use of cannabis. And if it is a genuine medicinal use, then there is the opportunities to, to have that prescribed to you. In terms of um, recreational use of cannabis, that is still illegal. So if you are taking recreational use of cannabis and you don't want to mix with criminals, then you're actually breaking the law by taking it. So technically you are a criminal. Um, and I'm not gonna get into any more of the detail about that, but there will be lots of other um, websites out there and, and debating societies about that. But if you wanna change the law, campaign, write to your MP, write to, to Jason Harwin, I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. I've got one from Christian Collis. Hello, I like taking photos of the stars and night sky, which requires being in a location where the light pollution is low. But as I live in Lincoln, I would have to go to a remote location for this, a bit more into the countryside. Can I go for my walk at night to do my photography? You can go for your walk at night to do your photography, but if you have to travel an unreasonable distance to be able to do that and get out of Lincoln City, um, to, for instance, go to the walls or something, then that's an unreasonable journey. Um, and that would just be a journey to facilitate your hobby, which is not within the guidelines. Uh, from Lisa Horrell, with regards to funerals, what are the rules and are we allowed to have a small gathering after, such as the 10 to 12 people attending the funeral, of course, while still following the social distancing regulations? Uh, this is, is a really emotive subject and the Local Resilience Forum have got um, a guidance document they prepared for people around uh, funeral um, celebrations and, 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 and you know, just mourning the death of, of a loved one. If you want to either contact the Local Resilience Forum or if you can forward through to Lincolnshire Police Media your email address um, I'll be more than happy to share that with you. Um, it, it should be on the um, Local Resilience Forum website as well. Um, got a question from Andy Mellett Brown. We're a volunteer team running a local food bank. We want to deliver leaflets to potential customers by volunteers dropping leaflets through letter boxes. As long as we keep two metres from people, are we okay to do that? Um, there's loads of magazines and newspaper delivery services out there and um, we've had, I've had um, contact with a few other people who've been in a similar situation to you Andy and the, um, the advice I would give you is that if you can get those leaflets to the, the address in a different way that would save your um, volunteers who are going out delivering the, the leaflets if you could safeguard them by doing it differently, i.e. moving them in a stockpile in the local um, shop, etc., then that might be a way around this. There's no rules to say that you can't do this, but you just need to be ensuring that you're protecting them and protecting the people whose houses you're delivering things into. Because if one of your members of staff has coronavirus, they're potentially going to be delivering it to lots of other households or they might come into contact with a household that has coronavirus and then they're taking it and spreading it elsewhere. So you just need to really think it through and be careful. There's nothing to say that you can't do it, but just have consideration. Uh, from Sarah Rainey, are we able to take our cars into a garage to get an MOT or is it still extended? It's currently extended for six months, but if you've got an MOT testing centre that is open, they are conducting MOTs. Mm -hmm. Uh, from Melly Austin, silly question, I guess, but my daughter is a quad skater. Is she okay to skate round as part of exercise? She's 18. 
I don't even know what a quad skater is. Does anybody? I don't know. I don't know. I don't it's exercise. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like exercise, and if it's something remotely like roller skating, I'm not sure, then I, I see no issue with that at all. As long as they weren't travelling um, mm. a, an unreasonable distance to do it. Okay, I've got a question from Mimi Elizabeth. How are you approaching people when you see them out? As no one knows anyone's story and background, and some may be suffering with mental health and don't want people approaching them. And it's the approach that we've had across Lincoln Triplets this whole time is that engagement in um, in that friendly manner that we do, and we do really well. So we would stop, we would talk to you as um, a human being to review another human being with that respect um, about what you're doing, where you where you are, why you're there and just engage, explain and encourage if it's outside of the guidelines um, and try and understand why somebody is out there. I know Stuart and I were out this weekend um, on patrol in Lincoln in Arbitry, Arbitry. Um, and we spoke to quite a number of people who were out um, with their families in the park etc but equally we also spoke to some people who were gathering and, and drinking alcohol um, and we then disperse them and if they hadn't have to disperse then we would have enforced the legislation around that but the very first point of contact is to engage with the individual on a very human level. Okay, I've got a question from Tommy uh, from Twitter. Is there a time limit for outside exercise if you stay alone and in open countryside? I presume that the question is is how long you stay out rather than the time of day. Um, I mean, the, the, the guidance talks around uh, an hour or so and things like that, but, but again, it's putting boundaries on things like that is, is always going to be very difficult. See, circumstances are going to be different. All we would say is just what's reasonable under those circumstances is the question people should be able to answer. Uh, from Mick Rylett, I sold my motorhome before the lockdown. The person would like me to deliver it to him so he can self-isolate in it as he has cancer. Can I do this? It's one hour for my address. I would ask the question about where that individual is self-isolating now um, and they must be living in a, in a premise and if they've got cancer living in a motorhome seems a bit strange. Um, however, I've no idea if you want to speak to us separately about that in terms of that um, the, the level of detail there, then more than happy for you to ring one on one and, and get a little bit more detail about that particular one from lee gregory what what are you doing about all the thefts fly tipping and burglaries in rural areas policing them is what we're doing catching those criminals because what we haven't stopped doing is um the normal core business of policing and you will have seen on the on the news over the last few days we've had some tremendous results with some of our proactive operations around criminality whether it's burglary, whether it's um, drug dealing, whether it's um, theft of motor vehicles, etc., we will be out there and we will catch criminals and we will charge you and put you in jail because that's what we're good at. Um, so hopefully you take heed of that and you cease those activities, but if you don't, then we will be after you. So that is a very, very clear message for criminals out there. In terms of fly tipping, it's really, really difficult in, because we've got um people who fly tip it's difficult to catch them um and they're an absolute blight on our communities and no respect for anybody um when they're dumping rubbish at the end of a farmer's field or whatever and it's, it really really irritates me if we can catch them or if anybody out there knows who's doing this then please let us know through 101 or try and stop this number then we will do our best to actually work with the environment agency and the local authority to prosecute people who do that. Uh, from Simon Watts, can you please explain how speed camera vans are classed as essential work? Okay, um, I, I will make no apologies here for having speed cameras out and uh, basic officers who are out there trying to catch motorists speeding and use mobile phones and drink driving. It's essential work because it saves lives. Um, we have uh, some unique circumstances in Lincolnshire with our roads. Uh, we also have um, amongst per head of population some of the highest numbers of people killed and seriously injured each year on our roads. So um, speed cameras are one of those uh, options that we take to 
help reduce speed on our roads and to prosecute those that are um, excessively speeding uh, on our roads. So um, I'd make no apologies for having those, those resources out there are essential use um, of, of our resource and they do go some way to uh, helping to save lives and uh, stop serious collisions from happening. I think there's also been a couple, Lucy, um, about asking us why we're not policing some roads about speeding. So this is the other side of the car coin where people want us to be more progressive in certainly some of our rural communities as well. Um, so in that respect, um, I would say we try to get to where the problems are. Um, we also encourage Community Speed Watch, which at this time has been suspended. Um, but those communities who do feel that they need more of an extra police support about speeders in their area, then please get in touch and we'll try and work with you to um, reintroduce Community Speed Watch when the restrictions are lifted. And if I remember rightly, there was also a query about um, the, that speed enforcement is a cash cow and that we can get loads of money from all of the tickets that we issue. Um, just to make that really clear, we don't get a penny from that in terms of policing. There's um, a certain amount of money which does go to the Road Safety Partnership to help um, road safety initiatives to reduce the, the harm that's caused on roads. But policing per se does not get any of the funds that come from tickets. And the location of those speed camera vans around the county, they are intelligence led and they are led by where we see issues and hotspots around the county. So it's not just in some random place, they are there for a reason. We did have some specific um, comments, questions from into us. One from Robert Stokes, who talked about speeding in Boston, and one on Twitter from um, MFLP. Um, who says uh, uh, speed checks, asking for speed checks done in Tussle Thorpe um, in his time to the day. It's very, um, there's lots of fast traffic going through. And one from a, a Twitter handle D1983D um, about speeding checks done in North Hyken. Yeah, so that hopefully answers all of your queries there. Uh, we've got a question from Jack Benny about social media. Um, could you please elaborate on police officers uploading in uniform on social media, such as TikTok and Instagram? As there has been a lot uploaded recently due to COVID-19, is that allowed? Okay, I think if you rewind your Facebook all the way back to the beginning of this, and I think we answered that in the first 10 minutes, that um, I've, I've got no problem with um, our use of social media. I think we've been quite responsible on that, but we do work closely with our media team to make sure that we don't stretch ourselves and um, end up in, 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 in trouble. <laughs> I'll just go back to some of the, uh, the pre-asked ones as well. There were a few um, came in from an anonymous people asking about drugs. I'll just read this one out. They all are along the same lines. Uh, this one asks, how do I go about reporting drug suspicions of possible dealing and using fees? It's only suspicion that I'd like to remain anonymous at all times. So anonymous is Crime Stoppers 0800 mm -hmm. 555 or 101 if you want to report it directly to the police. You still don't have to give your details there. Um, and I would encourage anybody to report not just drugs um, activity, but any other illegal activity that you that you see. The, the more information that we get about something, the richer the picture of the intelligence that we can build a case to, to actually operate on. And another um, more general question, one from um, a direct message into us. Uh, we don't have the name of this person, I'm afraid, but they ask, I keep seeing Facebook pages trying to sell real, uh, inverted commas, real DVL, DVLA licences. Who do I need to report this to? Well, that, that's fraudulent. Um, and I would say they, there's, there's two routes. There's, there's action fraud uh, to report that through. And, and, and they are set up to deal with, with fraud and sometimes will also work with us in terms of fraud, fraud activity. Um, that would be the first point of calling. If, if you, you feel that uh, you've not had any response to that, then the second response will be 101 through to, to us to, to have a look at. We have a um, uh, officers that uh, are specialised in this arena as well that work with Action Ford over those types of cases. John Whitmore asks us, living down on the reservoir at Surf Fleet, we've seen an increase in the number of walkers and, ex and exercisers driving down here and using the lovely River Glen walkways. This hasn't caused any problems apart from an increase in more litter. Around six weeks ago, an old green painted bus appeared over the lock bridge and parked in the allocated car park for visitors to the area. The bus has been converted into a motorhome and people have been living in it. Last week it moved behind the car park into a property owned by the people whose house is in that area but are not living there. 
why they decided to live here when the condition stated for the lockdown was and still is to stay at home. Other motorhomes also have used the area to stay overnight, parking down Glen Road, way past the ship port. Can one of your teams investigate, please? Sure, sure um, for sure. If you ring one on one and um, report that in as and when something happens, we will send a response um, out to deal with that and have a look at it. But if I can just um, assure people that just because people are living in a motorhome, it doesn't say that they don't have anywhere else to live. There's a lot of people who um, either live in motorhomes full time or have um, rented out their house. And there, was, um, there was a few families who were supposed to be going off to Portugal um, and they'd all rented out their houses full time. They had their motorhomes ready to go and then the lockdown happened and they couldn't go back home. So they ended up having to live in, um, in their motorhomes for some time and, they're all, and are still in there. So we don't know the individual circumstances, but if you ring within to us when it happens, we will take a look at it. Another question from an anonymous person. They ask, who do I report ice cream trucks to, please? There was one in North Icon yesterday, and I'm pretty sure they're not essential. I think I answered one of these last time as well. Yeah. Um, ice cream trucks is a legitimate business, a takeaway business. And as long as there's social distancing within the queue to that, then there is absolutely no issue and no problem with that. And as I said last time, my kids would love the ice cream van to come around there we live so we can at least get an ice cream, but we'd obviously do it socially distantly. That's a word. <laughs> Daniela Ross asks, I wondered if I could get some advice, please. I have a close friend, single mum with two children. She's kept herself and them completely isolated, but is now really struggling with it. Would we be allowed to move her and the children into our house with my family for the duration? Um, if she was moving in and then becoming part of your household, then that's not a problem because she would just be moving house. Um, as it were, so and it sounds like she could probably do with the, the help and the support as well. Uh, if one from Vicky Neal, can you please um, let me know why? Oh, sorry. Um, is COVID 19 having an effect on CPS decision making times? Many thanks. Um, it, I don't think it's having a, an impact on their decision making times because we, we're still doing that remotely. Um, the court processes have been slowed down in terms of how we get trials to court. Um, but the, the Ministry of Justice are working on that with the Home Office at the moment to see how we can do that differently. We do have virtual trials now and we have virtual remand hearings. So for instance, this week we've had um, a, a number of drug dealers who were charged yesterday and they were um, put before the courts via the virtual remand hearing. And the CPS made the decision on those charges within the 12 hours that they were in custody. So I've got no um, concerns over the CPS decision making timelines. The trials are something which we, we are working with to make sure that we can continue to do that as best we can. Uh, from Darren Godson, if I have a complaint being dealt with by Netlam about an officer that has been ongoing for three years, who do I contact that is higher up to get this resolved? Um, contact our professional standards department if you've got something um, specific that you want to raise there. Uh, one from Sam Crump, um, he asks, can you tell me are the police enforcing lockdown and going to reports of people visiting homes that they don't live in? As my friend has a party going on at a house near her and there are people from five different houses at this party and she says Skegness police are not interested. Okay, uh, I think we've answered similar questions to that already uh, to, today. Um, we do uh, look at those incidents and, and deal with them. Uh, that particular instance, uh, I haven't seen what the response may have been and what the decision making was, but on the face of what you said, um, that would be something that we would be wanting to try and resolve if possible at the time. Um, and if there are any issues around that, I'd encourage you to, to, to report it back in. One from, um, apologies if the pronunciation is wrong, Tomas uh, Delhi. He asks, I've been in self isolation for six weeks. I really, really would like to travel back home to Hungary. Mentally, mentally I start really struggling with the isolation. If I would return to Hungary, I have to spend 14 days in quarantine, unless I can prove that I spent 14 days in quarantine or epidemiological, that's the one, thank <laughs> you, surveillance in the UK. 
is there any way I can get proof of that or any way I can re request to be under that surveillance? It would be easier in here than back here, back there. Can you please help me with it? I don't think we've got anything like that in place. So our public health um, colleagues would be taking the lead on that, but there's nothing in, um, in terms of that health passport type approach that we've got in this country. Um, so I would suggest that if your um, country of destination has a quarantine system in place and it and you're traveling from the UK, then you just have to go through their systems um, when, once you land there. I think we've got time maybe just for two more, so we do one more and then one more live. Mm -hmm. um, one about roads and speeding again from at Gaz Glib on Twitter. He asks, why are the roads nowhere near as quiet as they were at the beginning of the lockdown? Has the stay home, save lives been changed? Or are people realising that the police are doing nothing to combat those who don't adhere, adhere to the rules to so just do as they want? When it, when the first when the lockdown first started, we saw a massive drop off in traffic. And um, I think our traffic dropped to about 50% mm. across the county. Um, over the last couple of weeks, we have seen um, a, an increase in the traffic but certainly not back to normal levels, around about 10% increase in um, where we were when we first started the lockdown. And a number of businesses are now starting to operate, people are starting to go back to work. Um, and that for me is part of where the increase in traffic has come from. What we don't see is, um, is families and days out going and just driving to the coast, etc. It all seems to be on the main arterial routes um, in and out. And we do see that um, the traffic increasing at certain times of day, which would suggest that it's work times, i.e. on the morning, um, at rush, what we would normally have had as rush hour and on the on the evening, what we would normally have had as rush hour as well. So they're the times which suggests to me that it's um, people going to work. And if their work is a legitimate um, business that they're going to, then there is nothing to say that they can't do that. Mm -hmm. Finally, from Cliff Rust, I do a lot for a caster in Bloom. This requires plenty of maintenance at this time of year. Can I go out and clear the odd planter and effect repairs, etc., ready for planting, hopefully in June? Obviously, I would be working alone. If I'm, if, I suppose the question is, first of all, does it come under what you would deem reasonable under government guidance, but it also comes down to if you're going out there uh, as any worker would perform work that you can't do at home and you're maintaining social distancing, uh, I personally would say for your own well-being, but also for the people who enjoy Caster in Bloom and you're giving pleasure for, uh, I think that is acceptable. And that's all we've got time for now. Okay, hopefully this has been helpful. If you've got any feedback, then please put it um, put on our social media platforms because I would love to, to see that what that um, sounds like. And um, we'll wait and see what the, the government guidelines are going to be over this weekend. We will get as much information out there into the public arena as to what this feels like for policing our communities. Um, and just for us from here at Lincolnshire Police, Thank you for your support. We really appreciate all of the support that we've had from the public and our communities and stay safe. Thank you. Bye.